uh, friends we are going to talk about language learning and teaching especially second language learning and teaching um, it is a vast area it is not possible to talk about all the aspects of language learning and teaching uh, in a short period of time but I will try to explain certain fundamental things and some important aspects what you should take care uh, and what you should know when you are going to teach a uh, language especially a second language. Uh, Let us first understand what is second language. As you know we have uh, terms like uh, mother tongue, other tongue. We consider mother tongue to be the language that a child learns before she goes to school. This may include the languages of her house, home, neighborhood and peer group and any language that she learns after she has learnt or acquired mother tongue we call that second language. The mother tongue is also known as first language. So, any language that is acquired or learnt after a child has learnt mother tongue or first language we call that language second language. Uh, second language also includes a foreign language. The difference between second language and foreign language is that the second language is visible. It can be seen, it can be found in the immediate vicinity or immediate neighborhood of the child. But a foreign language is not immediately uh, visible or immediately available in the country. That means, uh, for example, we have English as a we call it a second language in India. Why? Because English is used for communication in India, English is used in education in India and it is available. We can find certain programs, radio, TV programs, mass media, newspapers, journals, etc. in English. So, it is uh, available in our own country. But English is possible that in some countries where it is not used in education, mass media, etc., there it may be a foreign language. Uh, Chinese, Arabic, German, French for example, for us Indians they are all foreign languages. Why? Because we do not need them to communicate and they are not readily available in various domains in our country. Now coming to we have understood what is mother tongue and what is other tongue or second language. Now let us understand how a child acquires mother tongue. Uh, there are various theories, I will not go into that how what are the stages of mother tongue, you must have learnt it elsewhere. But we differentiate between acquisition and learning. Acquisition is product of subconscious process and it is very similar to the process children undergo when they acquire their first language. So, even uh, it is possible that in second language also there can be language acquisition and learning on the other hand is a conscious acquisition of language. Conscious effort is necessary to learn a language and a teacher or a school provides conscious knowledge about the target language. In mother tongue however, we are subconsciously learning or acquiring our mother tongue. So, uh, there are various stages, but no one is actually giving the child uh, formal instruction in language learning. So, a child in her mother tongue is not taught what is grammar, what is singular, what is plural, what is syntax, what is phrase, what is clause, subordinate clause, etc. But by hearing what her parents talk to her and when she grows up say around uh, one and a half years of age, then she interacts with other persons who know that language and she has also mastered how to produce certain phrases, words, sentences and by this kind of interaction she acquires mother tongue. Whereas, in second language learning this the, uh, the things are opposite. There the person who is or a child who is learning a second language does not have access to that kind of uh, situation or environment which was available for mother tongue instruction or mother tongue learning. Here you will find that first the child has to hear, she has to listen to someone who knows the second language. Then there are various stages and she will go through that like learn the sounds, how the sounds correspond to certain letters, then how sounds are combined to form words, 
how words are created, how words are formed and how words combine to form phrases, clauses and sentences and various other things. So, that is the basic difference. Now, when we talk about uh, what a teacher should do to help children learn second language, then there it is important to remember that there are differences between uh, the two processes. In mother tongue, the focus is on reading and writing. We help the students acquire the reading and writing skills. Why? Because the child as she has grown, uh, she has already acquired the skills of listening and speaking. So, we do not focus so much on these two skills. Whereas, in second language learning, since the child naturally has not acquired the power or the skill of listening and speaking. So, first we have to teach her how to listen to the sounds or whatever is communicated to her and then also try to speak. And once she has mastered listening and speaking, then we go to reading and writing. So, in mother tongue, reading and writing are the major skills that we focus on and in second language acquisition, in second language learning, we focus more on listening and speaking first and then go to reading and writing. Uh, there are uh, uh, certain uh, commonalities between uh, language uh, acquisition and language learning. Uh, as I have already mentioned that uh, language learning has in acquisition several stages. Similarly, the second language learners also go through stages. They also construct grammars, it is not already there. Uh, third thing that is important uh, for us to know at this stage is that uh, it is not that language comes from outside. You must have heard or learnt about some, uh, some theories uh, like that of Chomsky where he has proposed that all human beings, every child has been given by nature the capability or capacity to learn a language is not a particular language, but language. So, in every child's brain, there is a device called language acquisition device, which contains kind of the blueprint of grammar, the blueprint of the structure of language. And there are certain other things there, uh, like we have universal grammar. Now, talking of universal grammar, uh, it is important for us to know that what does it contain in the language acquisition device or the brain of a child. Uh, see, universal grammar it is a very a big topic, but uh, let us have certain uh, major features of it uh, described to you. Uh, we say that there are certain principles in every language and there are certain parameters. For example, in every language you will find that it has to have a verb and if there is a subject, if a person is performing the action then it may be preceded or followed by an adjective. And if there is a verb, if there is an action performed, then it will be described in terms of the manner, time, place. So, we will have adverbs. Then no language will find can have three or four subjects uh, in a row. You would not have say 10 verbs in, in a sequence, in a sentence. So, there are certain principles that what can uh, be done in a language, what is possible and what is not possible in a language and within those principles the parameters differ. So, you can have a subject in a language, a verb in a language, object in a language, but how to arrange them that may differ from language to language. So, you will find that a language like uh, English and uh, Khasi in India, we have the subject, verb and then object. But there are languages in India uh, like Hindi, Maithili, Bengali, Assamese, Bodo, etc., where you will find that subject, object, and verb order is there. So, subject comes first, like me, then the object, khana, kaunga, verb, I will eat food. In English, it is the opposite, I will eat food, I will eat something. So, first the subject, then verb and then object, but the principles are same that you can have in a sentence. Uh, the major elements in a sentence would be subject, verb and object and in their parameters they differ 
uh, uh, in la different languages. So that is important. Then uh, we talking of uh, what is language acquisition and what is language learning. Uh, there was a time when people thought that uh, based on uh, the old theories that language learning is basically imitation or habit formation. So, you teach them the children uh, certain uh, grammar rules and then have some uh, uh, structure uh, pattern given and they practice it and they will automatically learn a language, but it did not work. Then later on we had various other theories and they are referred to as cognitive theories or uh, mentalist theories. There the child was thought uh, considered as not a blank uh, say state where you write something. You cannot pass the rules or uh, the words from uh, the teacher's mind or teacher's mouth to the child so easily. Actually the child or the learner has to make effort and she has to actually use the language in context then only the language will be learned. Then we also had theories uh, based on Vygotsky's uh, we have uh, constructivism that language or any anything can be learned if the child is provided scaffolding which can be a teacher, parent or somebody else and then uh, she is helped in learning and ultimately that scaffolding is removed and the child becomes automatic uh, uh, autonomous learner. She learns in the zone of proximal uh, say where uh, uh, a proximity where someone who knows better than the child better than the student is present and she helps the student or the child learn something by providing the scaffolding, some support and the child learns, she explores, she finds the meaning uh, what is there, uh, what she is learning. So, those theories were there. So, nowadays the focus is on in language learning acquisition the communicative competence, not just competence but the communicative competence and that is why we talk about the communicative language teaching learning. And now let us understand what is the uh, I have used certain terms competence, communicative competence. So, it is better to understand what these terms are. Uh, we talk of uh, linguistic competence and linguistic performance. Linguistic competence is that the all the knowledge about the language, all the rules what is possible, what is not possible, how language works. So, all the abstract understanding of that knowledge about language is called linguistic competence. And when a person performs something that means when she makes specific utterances including grammatical mistakes, non-linguistic features etcetera then we call that performance. So, competence uh, uh, everyone who is normal, every child uh, who has uh, uh, learnt a language has linguistic competence, but when it comes to making sentences, producing sentences, understanding sentences then she may falter and there we find differences. So, uh, say uh, if there are uh, hundred Hindi speakers they all share a knowledge about Hindi language that is their linguistic competence, but all these hundred speakers may be speaking differently. So, uh, I, I will pronounce a sentence a uh, word differently and some other person will pronounce it differently. My, sen my uh, uh, say uh, intonation may be different from the speaker Hindi speaker uh, in uh, some other place. So, that will be my performance. So, I will say maine khana kha liya. Somebody may say maine khana kha liya. Maine khana kha liya. So, see these are various utterances. So, based on the knowledge that I had about the structure of Hindi language. So, competences that knowledge the whole knowledge about the rules and other of the aspects of a language and performances actually using these rules. Then we talk about communicative competence what does that mean? So, it is not enough to know the structure of a language and make some utterances it has to be uh, done in context because we live in society. So, this term will uh, help us understand what we mean uh, by uh, communication. So, there are four uh, uh, major uh, features uh, sub areas of communicative competence. 
one is linguistic competence that makes us know how we use the grammar, the syntax, the vocabulary of a language and uh, it involves tasks like uh, what do, uh, what words do I use, how do I just uh, uh, put the words in phrases and sentences. So, this kind of knowledge or competence will be linguistic competence. The next is social linguistic competence. It is knowing how to use and respond to language appropriately given the setting, the topic and the relationships among the people who are communicating and it involves structures uh, or things like uh, say I uh, will give you an example for, uh, for example in Hindi uh, there are three pronouns, second person pronouns tu, tum and aap. In English we have only you. So, even if a child is talking to uh, her father or mother or teacher whoever she will be using you, you are going, you sit down, uh, you come here. So, you is used for all types of relationships, but in Hindi we have three uh, pronouns tu, tum and aap second person pronouns. So, it is not enough for the child or a learner to know that there are three second person pronouns in Hindi tu, tum and aap. She also has to know when to use tu, when to use tum and when to use aap. So, it will be a problem if uh, someone addresses uh, her teacher as tu kaha jayega in Hindi. For, uh, so, where will you go? We have to know that with teachers we have to use the pronoun aap and when aap is used even if the addressee is similar one person we have to keep the verb in plural. So, you cannot say aap kaha jayega, it should be aap kaha jayenge. Of course, we will find this variation in many parts of India uh, in different uh, varieties of Hindi. Uh, some people do use aap kaha jayega or aap kaha jaoge which should be used with tum kaha jaoge, tum kaha with tum. Uh, so, all this kind of knowledge, this kind of understanding that what is proper, what is not proper in society when you are communicating with others come under our sociolinguistic competence. The third one is discourse competence. Uh, it is not that we always talk uh, in words, phrases and sentences. We also sometimes orally or in written language make bigger discourses. So, we talk in text, we write some text. We also for example, uh, right now I am uh, uh, talking and I am not uh, giving you each uh, sentences separately. I the whole uh, this is whole discourse what all these sentences form a discourse. So, some 10, 15, 20, 20 sentences they are conveying something, some message. So, when we construct something in language which is larger than stretches of uh, larger than sentence and that means they are stretches of uh, language then that is a discourse and understanding what is discourse competence we ask questions like uh, how are words, phrases and sentences put together to create conversation, to create speeches, to write email messages, to write newspaper articles. So, all these come under discourse competence. Then the last one is strategic competence. Strategic competence is knowing how to recognize and repair communication breakdowns, how to work around gaps in one's knowledge of the language and how to learn more about the language and in the context. So, uh, suppose you started a sentence where in Hindi and uh, you wanted to say main uh, kal and then you forget the word. So, what should come? Because we have chosen kal. So, the verb should be either in past because kal means yesterday or kal can also be tomorrow. So, your verb should be in past or in future. It will not be in present progressive. Uh, so, you cannot say main kal kha raha hu. No, the, it should be main kal kha raha tha or main kal khaunga. So, when the communication breaks or if you are talking to someone and you said something unpleasant or you find that the words that you have used is not proper or the sentences that you made were ungrammatical or not uh, suitable to the situation, then you change it. So, that comes under strategic competence. Talking of uh, language, second language acquisition, we also have to talk about critical period.
This is a term used in mother tongue acquisition, the first language acquisition. Uh, that is a period, there are certain uh, periods of age where language acquisition is fast or uh, swift, where the uh, language uh, acquisition proceeds easily, swiftly without external interventions. So, that period is called critical period and it is believed that the best uh, part of life to acquire language, mother tongue or first language is uh, from birth to puberty. So, if the children uh, master all the aspects of grammar, the vocabulary, reading, writing uh, between that age so say uh, birth to puberty, they uh, are at advantage, they can learn it better. It is not that they stop learning or acquiring language, but the best part of their age is to acquire mother tongue or first language between birth and puberty around up to 13 or 14 years of age. And uh, why it is so? Because in our brain you know there are billions of neurons and there are millions of synapses, synapses where the neurons uh, meet uh, or they converse, they talk through synapses. Synapses contain all the information and they pass uh, information from one neuron to another. Now, what happens? Whatever information comes, the piece of information through our ears, through our eyes, uh, touch and other things, they all go to neurons and neurons then deposit kind of deposit it in synapses. Then synapses uh, take part in uh, memory, uh, preserving memory. So, certain information will be stored in short term memory and certain information will be stored in long term memory. There are various theories and various other aspects, I will not uh, tell you all the details uh, of that. Uh, roughly short term memory involves biochemical changes, it does not change the neurons or the shape of synapses. The, the short term memory is uh, chemical uh, changes, biochemical uh, changes where chemical compositions change, but in long term memory the changes occur also in the neurons and synapses. So, in order to become something which is stored in short term memory, go to long term memory, uh, more practice is required. The information has to be important, relevant, useful, then only it will go to the long term memory. And at that period, at that age, say between birth to puberty, the concentration of uh, the density of uh, synapses is more and even the children's uh, brains, uh, they are more uh, neuroplastic. That means, it has capacity to change itself. It can uh, add certain neurons, it can uh, delete certain neurons, the useless uh, neurons and make various other changes. So, that is why people think it is better or uh, that is the best period uh, to learn uh, or acquire mother tongue. Now, uh, you must be thinking whether it is important in second language acquisition too. Uh, it is not really a critical period in second language acquisition and learning. Uh, the term uh, that is used uh, in the field is called sensitive window. So, although there is not uh, nothing called critical period in second language uh, acquisition, there is something similar to that and we call that uh, sensitive period. That means, there are certain periods of age where some kind of uh, language acquisition, some parts of uh, language acquisition is better, we understand something uh, better, we learn something better and then uh, there are some uh, other uh, periods where uh, things are not so good. For example, the sensitive uh, period or the sensitive window for phonology is shorter, uh, that is shortest actually, uh, whereas morphology and syntax they can be learned at later part of life also. So, uh, that uh, distinction we have to remember. Uh, coming to uh, second language acquisition, we have already talked about uh, uh, that it is uh, similar to uh, mother tongue acquisition or first language acquisition. Uh, there are certain uh, uh, say theories and certain uh, areas that are important in second language acquisition and one such uh, theory is that of comprehensible input hypothesis. This is actually a hypothesis. Uh, it believes that uh, well, it, it believes that uh, people or children uh, learn language like mother tongue and there is a natural order. So, like 
mother tongue acquisition or first language acquisition, uh, there is a natural order of learning or acquisition in second language too. And if you give something to the child, to the learner, the, we call that input. If the input is one step beyond her current stage of linguistic competence, then she will acquire second language better. If the input that you are giving is uh, lower than her present state or present stage or if it is higher than her present stage, then the input will not be comprehensible. For example, if you are teaching uh, say a child is learning in class 2 some asp aspects of English and she has not mastered how to use uh, say can, could, uh, shall, should and various other things about grammar, active, passive and your text that, uh, that is given to the child and it contains lot of active passive sentences, lot of passive constructions. So, uh, if uh, the text contains lot of passive constructions, use of can, could, uh, shall, ought to, etc., then and child has uh, no knowledge what these uh, terms are, how to use these uh, grammatical constructions, then that will be much beyond her present stage. So, that will not become comprehensible to her. Uh, say for example, if a child is given a text or uh, which contains uh, say class 3 child is given a text that contains the words that she had learned in class 1, the grammatical constructions that she had learned in class 1. Now, that is much below her present stage that also will not become comprehensible. So, it has to be little higher, slightly higher one step beyond her current stage of linguistic competence. So, this is important for you to understand because if your material that you are using in classroom is uh, beyond her uh, say uh, linguistic competence, much beyond her uh, linguistic competence, she will not understand. If it is lower than that, then also the child will not understand it. Another thing that is important is uh, uh, for us to learn and understand is affective filter hypothesis. Uh, this takes care of emotional factors. It is uh, important in uh, second language learning, not so much in acquisition. And this means that various factors, emotional factors like self-confidence, uh, self-image, motivation, anxiety, they also play a role in second language acquisition. So, you have to keep that also in mind. If the level of anxiety is high, if the level of self confidence is low, then the child will not be able to learn language better. Uh, the third uh, thing uh, under these theories uh, is monitor hypothesis. This is also important in uh, say language learning, not so much in uh, uh, acquisition. And this talks about uh, how a child uses her uh, linguistic competence or uh, lang uh, communicative competence to monitor her performance or edit the language that she is using. So, various other things are related to it, uh, but that is not uh, part of the uh, uh, video, we will talk about that later. Now, lastly, uh, many people, many teachers think that language teaching is grammar teaching. So, if you teach grammar, then the child will learn language, but that is not true. Grammar learning is not language learning. And that is why you must have seen many people who are very good uh, at grammar, they know all the rules of grammar, they have mastered uh, memorized grammars, uh, but they cannot uh, make a sentence, they cannot write a coherent uh, uh, say text, a uh, letter, essay. So, grammar learning is not language learning that uh, you have to remember. So, language is learnt whether it is second language or, or uh, foreign language by using it in context, by actually using the language that uh, the structures that the child has learned in situations, social situations where she can really use it and by giving more and more uh, uh, say uh, uh, opportunities to the child to hear the second language and use it that will make her uh, proficient in second language. So, if you remember these things, you can uh, uh, the theories, the hypothesis, the various important aspects what is involved in second language learning then you can make your classroom better and the child will certainly learn a second language better.